Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We're, uh, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, and I'm a special personal pride to be able to welcome Helga Lund. Um, now, of course, there's a very, I have a very visceral feeling here. You know, I'm a Norwegian. You know, but now my family was too poor and had to leave before we discovered oil in the North Sea. So they came as poor little dirt farmers, but uh, we went back and it's a great, great joy to see how, uh, what a fabulous jo job Norway has done with this patrimony. And, uh, and I give great credit to Statoil and especially to Helga Lund for this. Uh, it, I did not realize this until just a few minutes ago, that Helga is the longest serving CEO of a major oil company in the world. Now, I don't know when you started, Helga. You look like you're 28 now. I mean, I uh, can't quite figure out the math here, but, uh, but having a, you know, a long career in business, not that, but still to get to the top with, with Stott Oil and to lead such a fine company, because it's a, you know, it's a company that's in in the oil and gas business, but lives in the context of enormously high expectations for corporate social responsibility. Not just for how the company treats its employees and lives in its neighborhood, but the way in which it serves as an engine for progressive values inside Norwegian society. And, and it's been really remarkable to see how well they've done. It's a, it's a role model. You know, this is a, a state-owned oil company but it operates with the efficiency of the private sector and yet brings to its enterprise a very deep commitment to, again, doing the very best for the people of Norway. And Helga has been at the helm for 10 years, has led it from victory to victory. And fortunately, you know, like, like uh, Leif Erikson discovered oil in North America, and he's pumping like crazy in the Bakken field. So we're very happy to help that you're helping us with our recovery, Helga. And we're delighted that you're willing to be with us this afternoon to share your insights into the challenges that, uh, that Stott Oil faces. This is a complex industry. It's an industry with enormous cross-cutting pressures, and it all lands squarely on the shoulders of the CEO. And so we're going to learn a lot this afternoon. Would you please, with your applause, welcome Helga Lund. We're delighted to have him. Good, good afternoon. And uh, thank you, John, for these uh, very kind uh, words. And thank you for not putting more pressure on, uh, <laughs> on me. It's really a pre pleasure uh, being here. And uh, thank also to CICS for hosting this uh, event and also congratulations with uh, the new building. It's even nicer than the new district of office that we have in Oslo. Uh, so that's, that's good. Actually, Washington has always been one of my favorite uh, cities for how it looks, but also for what it is. And a few years back, uh, I appoint, appointed my closest advisor to head up uh, and actually open uh, the Stuttle office in, in Washington. And, um, that was Paul Eitrem, and I think some of you know him, and um, I told him, you better make up your mind very quickly, otherwise I take the position myself. <laughs> and it's in interesting to note that Washington has always been and remains to be at the center of many of the most important global uh, issues, whether it's security, defense, trade, development, or finance. But until recently, I would not have put uh, energy on that uh, list. Uh, however, given the renaissance of uh, the oil and gas industry in, um, in North America, it is very clear to all of us, I think, now that decisions made here is impacting not only North America oil and, ga oil and gas uh, and energy policies, but I think also on the global uh, arena. So I wanted today to try to structure my thoughts uh, in three different um, uh, themes. The first is the changing energy landscape with particular emphasis on what is going on in the oil and gas uh, uh, industry and uh, what we do to remain competitive in, in all the, the changes. Uh, secondly, I'll try to illustrate how important 
North America and particularly the US now is for Stator's uh, further development moving forward. Uh, and the final theme, which I think also connects the dots from the two first, is about how we both as a company, but also as an industry, respond to the challenges that we are faced with, including the topics of climate change uh, and, and also uh, community engagement as onshore activities come much, much closer to really where people, people live. These themes, in my opinion, are key to secure the long-term legitimacy of uh, uh, this industry, which I will come back to. First, a few words uh, about uh, Statoil. We are firmly rooted uh, in Norway. That is represent still roughly 60% of our overall global uh, production, which, is, which currently runs around 2 million barrels uh, uh, per day. And I think it's fair to say that Norway remains the foundation of our business, but also, I think, to a large extent, uh, our identity as uh, a company. We are actually the biggest offshore operator in the world, and I think very notably these days, we're also the second largest gas supplier to Europe. We have activities in uh, 35 uh, countries in Europe, Norway, Russia, Azerbaijan, the UK, and so on and so forth. We are based in Algeria, Libya, Angola, Nigeria. Just made huge gas discoveries in, in Tanzania, in Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, the US, and, uh, and finally also uh, Canada and we are in the process of building some long-term positions also in exploration in, uh, in, in Asia. I think it's fair to note that uh, this list hides in many ways both diversity and focus. We are represented in conventional offshore uh, operations, but also increasingly also onshore, particularly here in the US. Uh, but our focus is really on being a technology-focused uh, upstream company. So I think we are one of the bigger oil and gas companies that are very, very shallow in terms of uh, refinery activities. We actually only have two relatively small refineries in, in Europe. That's about, uh, that's about it. First, uh, on uh, the development of the oil and gas industry and the first point I make is that the last decade the oil price has almost tripled from roughly 30 to uh, around 110 today roughly but due to escalating investments increased costs more complexity and higher risks return on capital from companies in Stutter's peer groups i.e. the big oil and gas companies of the world has actually been reduced by one third of the last uh, decade. So I think it's, it's fair to say that currently the business model is not working properly. So the comp competitiveness of our industry simply must improve. We need to be much more disciplined in the way we employ capital and I think we need to find new ways of working so that we are slimmer and more efficient in the way we attack the business challenges that, uh, that uh, we are working on. The second point would be that some, th some people tend to think that oil and, and natural gas could and should be replaced by renewable and more climate friendly sources of energy. To those, I say with the International Energy Agency, that even in a low carbon society, the world needs our products. In their two degrees scenario, the IEA says oil consumption will be roughly at today's level and natural gas must and will increase significantly from the level that we see today. Most notably to replace coal in the electricity uh, production. And until 2035, the industry need to replace something like four times the current Saudi Arabia production in oil and more than 10 times the current production, annual production of, uh, uh, of, of gas, of Statoil, or, or Norway, that is. 
And I think if you look at the challenges that the industry have today in terms of bringing forward new supply at a cost-efficient way, I think most of you will agree that this is a formidable challenge, not only for business, but I think also for the society. The industry must remain competitive in the race for capital and talent to be, to be able to deliver on our mission to bring light, heating and transportation to the world. And I think to be uh, a re reliable source for economic growth to the world, including the US. Society, i.e. the politicians in this case, must incentivize the right decisions and to create a level playing field to addressing both the needs for energy, but also for less CO2 in the energy production. To succeed in this environment, Statoil has put in place a very focused uh, strategy for high value growth, for increasing efficiency, both in terms of cost and capital, and also to improve capital uh, discipline to be able to return adequate to shareholders as we move forward. And our response has been primarily in four areas. The first one is to revitalize Norwegian continental shelf. And most of you that follow the oil and gas industry closely, you know that a few years back, most thought that the oil and gas industry in Norway will just decline and, and rapidly uh, sort of go into non-existence. That has not happened. And the last few years, we have made major discoveries, even in the most mature areas, that, that has prolonged the, the, the life of Norwegian continental shelf in many decades. The second part of our strategy was to re-energize our exploration uh, efforts, which we did uh, 10 years back. And uh, the last few years, we have been, I think, the best oil and gas company in the world in terms of identifying, finding new conventional oil and gas uh, resources. We have also modernized our gas portfolio. We have moved away from the oil-linked gas contracts that uh, the European gas infrastructure was, was built on back uh, 20 years into gas-to-gas -gas and market-based uh, contracts. And uh, that has been, I think, very important. And we have also built or are in the process of building a quite solid gas business, not only in Europe, but also in, uh, uh, in the US, where we have a big position, in, in particularly in, in Marcellus. And, and that is really the fourth topic of our strategy, to to continue to build our unconventional business because we simply believe that will be an important part of long-term uh, energy supply. That, that really brings me to the topic about the importance of North America for, uh, for Statoil. I think we have shown some commitment. We have invested uh, billions of dollars over the last uh, uh, few years in, in the US particularly. We have more than 2,000 people now employed uh, here, and I don't know whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, Stator was named by the Progressive Policy Institute as the third most important overseas investor in the US en energy sector over the two previous years. And North America already provides uh, roughly 15% of the total production of uh, Stator uh, globally. We actually started back in 1987, but that was more marketing and trading activities. We took our first real position offshore Gulf of Mexico in 2004, and we are now represented uh, onshore in Gulf of Mexico, in Canada, predominantly offshore, but also with a small oil sands uh, uh, position. As we have proven, I think, uh, in our 40 years with Norwegian operations, safety always comes first and is essential to our business and our commitments and to our employees and the communities in which we operate. And one of the most important things we have learned throughout these four decades is that complacency and arrogancy is really the, 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 the most important enemy you have in, in, in terms of moving forward in improving day by day in, 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 this, in the safety field. And I think this is a general lesson for companies, but it's even more important in, uh, in, in the field of safety because every day is a new day and you have risks that you need to, uh, to, to, to handle. 
In Gulf of Mexico, we have uh, a number of uh, high quality fields being developed by our partners, seven, uh, that is. We are, have also now started a quite comprehensive drilling program, uh, started, started well operated, and we were setting the new Martin well a few, uh, a few weeks uh, uh, back. And uh, throughout uh, uh, this decade, at the back end of this decade, Gulf of Mexico will be one of the most important offshore regions in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Statoil. Offshore Canada, we have also built over the last few years quite significant uh, exploration positions, and uh, we got a large, large encouragement uh, last year where we actually, outside uh, Newfoundland, made the biggest offshore uh, oil discovery uh, last year. And a few weeks back, we decided to move a rig from Norway now to accelerate uh, the drilling program outside Canada over the next um, uh, few years. That brings me to onshore, onshore the US, where we are present in Marcellus. We entered that, in, uh, that area in 2008 in a uh, joint venture with Chesapeake. Subsequently, we entered uh, uh, Eagle Ford with Talisman in 2010. And in 2011, we acquired Brigham exploration to move into a quite significant position in, uh, in Bakken in North Dakota. And uh, I think Bakken, the Bakken field is named after a former Norwegian farmer called Otto Bakken. So I think the circles are now uh, uh, closed. And of course, we were new to onshore operations and unconventional operations, but we feel that we have the capability to be a competitive uh, player. Uh, that has a lot to do with uh, operating practices, I think, our values, and the way we use technology, and with a particular emphasis on uh, getting as much as possible out of the fields where we, uh, we, we operate. That brings me to my third and final theme of the day, and the way we work, and how I think our industry must face the new challenges of the future. The challenge of, of climate change is, of course, global. But globally, the big problem of today is that it's too much CO2 and actually too little politics. But while waiting for effective global measures, local alternatives have to be implemented. And since I'm in Washington, let me use the US onshore as an illustrative example. Operator ships in the three main U.S. onshore plays give us the opportunity to apply our values in the field. And at Statoil, we say that um, how we do things is as important as what we do. And we recognize that there have been concerns about air, water, climate impacts or shale gas, and tight oil development. And we are committed to work with peers with our peers, with government and other stakeholders to, to develop robust and appropriate standards and best practices throughout our operations. In our view, a number of states have put in place good and well thought through regulations for unco unconventional resource development. And we believe that regulations should reflect and cater to local conditions we call, because pop population density and issues related to water availability will tend to differ for instance, between Texas and Pennsylvania. And having said that, we can also see that there are areas in, in which some common best practices can be applied. We truly believe in the industry working with governments, with civil society, and with the scientific community to ensure that these resources are developed in a responsible and sustainable way. Let's take our operations in North Dakota as an example, how we're trying to implement these principles into, into practice. In, in the bucket, a lack of infrastructure for evacuating associated gas means we have to find innovative ways to minimize flaring and methane emissions. We have invested significantly over the last uh, few years in building our own pipelines 700 miles of pipeline in North Dakota to support our operations, including natural gas gathering system, as well as pipes to carry water and produced oil. 
We work closely with infrastructure providers to pro pro and proce processors to assist with future planning. We prioritize the use of leading wellhead technology and techniques to limit the impact of our operations. And our rig fleet is now entirely converted to biofuel application. And these systems actually replace up to 60% of the diesel with natural gas. As far as we can, we want to use gas rather than diesel to heat our fracturing fluids and our equipment. And we continue to innovate, which is important. We are evaluating several smaller scale technological pilots, like our partnerships with GE, on the use of compressed natural gas through the CNG in a box application, as well as local mi micro generation of electricity to further increase efficiency and reduced waste and emissions too. We, feel, we even feel our joint efforts have been recognized locally, perhaps also from time to time in, in, in DC. We are proud of the progress that we have made, but we recognize also that there are still lots of work to be done. Commercial scale shale gas and tight oil is still in its infancy, and there are many challenges from a business perspective, a social perspective and also from an environmental perspective. And successfully tackling these challenges will require more than the efforts of a single company, even an entire industry. Some progress has already been made. The state of North Dakota, for example, has an effective regulatory regime in place and the value of the gas produced incentivized constructing gathering system as quickly as economically and technically feasible. And Statoil is working actively with the government in North Dakota. We contribute to the North Dakota Petroleum Council flaring task force, for example, and are working hard to meet the flaring reduction targets put forward at the end of uh, January. But more is definitely needed. States can do more, encouraging the increased use of natural gas locally, for example, by giving companies flexibility to use natural gas to fuel their operations through drilling rigs and on-site on -site natural gas generators for electricity generation. More importantly, both the states and the federal government can help by streamlining permitting processes to re remove red tape to en enable infrastructure build-out faster. We need predictable and transparent processes for applications as well as a more efficient coordination between federal and state agency on permitting right, rights away. I'm glad to see that the Depart of, Department of Energy has prioritized the issue of infrastructure, infrastructure in its first quadrennial energy review, and we look forward to working with the DOE on this important uh, issue. <coughs> By enabling and encouraging the build-out of infrastructure for both oil and natural gas, particularly in the Bakken and on the Marcellus, policymakers will enable the traditional demand centers of the country better access to these resources. This would allow taking advantage of abundant natural gas as you seek to address the emissions intensity of your power fleet. As I've said, the teams I reflected upon today are global, so let me conclude by combining some global and local perspectives to it. In the world, 1.3 billion people lack access to electricity and 2.6 billion lack clean cooking facilities. And according to Wall Street Journal, at least 15 million Americans now live one mile of an oil or a gas well. And millions more live along the rail lines that we depend on to transport crude oil from these fields. These are examples of how our industry is entering new ground and territories, meeting new stakeholders, new expectations, and also new requirements. I could add to the list the discussions around fracking, use of chemical fluids, water contamination, and also methane leakage that I already talked about. And people care about what we do because what we do really matters. Our product matters, how they impact society matters, so people should really care. 
And again, examples where our industry must be able to build trust with, with society through engagement. My simple res recipe for engaging with society is linked to three words in conclusion. Transparency, in many ways, this is the new currency for trust. Secondly, dialogue, the need to engage with all stakeholders, whether you agree or not. And finally, responsibility, that means continually striving to improve our own operating environment. As a company, we are proud of the important and growing role that the US plays in Statoil's global strategy and ambitions. We know there is still more to do, both from industry and from government, as the unconventional revolution continues to unfold. And we look forward to continue to be a constructive uh, player here in the US, but also in a broader uh, context in the energy fields. And by that, thank you. Helga, thank you very much for, for those comments. And before we open it up to the audience, I just wanted to take the opportunity to ask you a few questions. You know, one of the reasons why we do uh, events like this is we firmly believe that sort of, you know, global industry leaders such as yourself have a lot of important perspectives that can help uh, a Washington policymaking audience both think about how we deal with international energy policy issues, but also, as you said, sort of the vast array of domestic energy policy issues that we're dealing with today. So I thought if I might maybe just start with something a little bit further afield and then we'll come back to, uh, to North America. Obviously, you know, uh, heard about sort of the complex challenge of managing a global portfolio and a lot of, uh, a lot of risk out there. One of the things that is sort of a, a predominant focus of conversation right now here in Washington is, uh, is what's happening in sort of uh, the Russia-Ukraine-Europe context. Uh, and I bring that up for starters because I think it is something that is, that is certainly a topic on everybody's mind these days and something that Statoil as a company has a perspective on, right? You said second largest supplier of gas to Europe, obviously also have interests in Russia, um, but then also have interest in growing interest in North America as well. What kind of perspective do you bring to sort of the geopolitical challenges that we face, you know, uh, uh, sort of in that part of the world? And how do you as a company think about sort of addressing or even engaging in those topics that obviously are, are, are sort of a huge issue vis-a-vis uh, -vis sort of government, government to government relationships, but certainly also uh, um, have sort of private sector and large sort of energy components to it as well. So actually during my 10 years, I have started to think more and more about oil and gas companies, not so much oil and gas com companies, but risk management institutions, <laughs> because that is really what we do every day in terms of technology, uh, safety, the regulatory environment, geopolitics, and so on and so forth. So, so, so really engage with all the risks that are associated oil and gas companies is, is critical, in, including geopolitics. And, and, and I think uh, the evidence on, of this is clearly that uh, you can almost see on the oil price, uh, the, you know, the geopolitical risks that uh, where that are for the, for, for the, for the time being. In, in terms of the, more, the, the current issue in, in, in Ukraine and, and the gas markets, if I comment on that uh, first, I, I think as, as we see it in the short term, there's no problem with, uh, with gas supply to, uh, to, to, to Europe in the sense that there have been a very mild winter, the storage uh, is full. So, so in the short term, there, there are no real issues about uh, supply. Uh, medium term, uh, you know, the levers that you can pull is, is really to run down storage. Uh, you could potentially, uh, if the, some of the gas from Russia can be rerouted re uh, outside Ukraine, you can, uh, Holland can probably add some more, Norway can add some, but not much, uh, and, and then LNG. Of course, Europe has to compete with other continents of the world to, to attract uh, more LNG. Uh, uh, in the longer term, uh, Europe is, uh, uh, you know, dependent on, I, I think, Russian uh, gas as, as we see it. And in a historic context, they have also been a very reliable supplier, I think, even though there have been difficult, uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, moments. 
there is no way that Statoil and Norway over the longer term can uh, can sort of replace uh, you know a fallout, for instance, on 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 on, on, on Russian gas. Sure. Um, maybe turning again to, to sort of the North American uh, uh, perspective and another issue that's been something we've been dealing a lot with over the last several weeks. As you know, just uh, several hours south of here, there was sort of another uh, crude by rail sort of safety incident where there was an accident again. And it's not, it's not new, it's sort of, but it's an issue that, as you sort of mentioned, as, as North America sort of comes to grips with all of the new supply that's coming online, we're dealing with these issues about how to guarantee safety of... Uh, product, whether it's moving, quite frankly, by pipeline or by rail, um, and how you sort of deal with those issues. You all are, you know, a significant developer in the Bakken, but also elsewhere around the country. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you're viewing um, the the sort of policy discussion here about safety issues. But then also, you had you had brought up sort of um, infrastructure issues more generally. Um, how those are sort of being dealt with, both on a policy side, but also in, in enabling you to do business. Well, I think my starting point is, is the one that I mentioned in, in my introduction in, in the sense that I think now the oil and gas industry is gradually and, and with some speed actually moving much closer to where people live uh, and offshore operations, for instance, are, are something different. So we need to respond to the concerns of the, mm -hmm. uh, of, of the society, both in the way we, the, the standards that we apply to our operations, but I think also the way we engage and actually that we take seriously the concerns of, of, of the people around our, uh, our activities also when it comes to, uh, to, to transport. And, and the starting point, in my view, must be that in every part of the business system, safety comes first mm -hmm. when you're working with hydrocarbons because they're explosives and that must be the starting point. You, you can never compromise uh, on, uh, uh, on that. <coughs> In the, the way we think about it is that we use only the, the highest standards uh, rail cars. Uh, we uh, employ independent uh, inspectors that check on the quality on, uh, on, on our cars and the operating systems uh, that we are running. And, and we are engaging uh, with the industry and also with regulators in, in, um, uh, in how we can uh, further uh, improve. The philosophy must be that uh, every incident we have uh, must be a source of new learning so that we can improve and improve and improve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Th that's the sort of philosophy that we have had offshore and, and in, in other parts of our operations. There should be no difference in, in this area, in my view. And, and of course, the, the unconventional and, and onshore activities in the US have e expanded very, very rapidly. So I think that both the, the industry and regulators need to, need to engage uh, and accelerate also the way we communicate around this to make sure that we get, uh, you, you know, the, the more, urgency. Uh, more urgency, but also that we learn quicker from each other too, mm -hmm. so, that, so that we can employ uh, best, uh, best practices. Mm -hmm. I think this is a prominent area where there is absolutely, in my view, no downside in engaging uh, even more. Sure. Right. Between uh, the, the companies and, uh, and regulators, mm. and and sort of you know moving sort of downstream in the process, you know one of the other major issues that we're dealing with here is you know obviously the United States is sort of surprised, uh, even though it's been about five or six years with the production surge that's happened here, and so we are sort of on a daily basis grappling with what that means for us, right? What does it mean? Is it abundance? Is it more self-sufficiency? What is it? And what do we do with it, right? What is the smart strategic option for the United States, both in foreign policy terms, but in terms of the growth of our economy? One of the big questions that we spend a lot of time here is what the policy should be around, whether it's LNG exports or crude exports, or even, quite frankly, product exports. We have a, 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 a sort of a, a discussion here after the sort of winter we've had on propane exports. So. Um, uh, the question is, is sort of how do you, as somebody who is placing more and more of sort of your business focus within North America, uh, look at that issue as sort of a deterrent or an, an enabler of creating value, which is sort of job number one for you, uh, creating value for the company and the investments that you've made here? And how do you look at the way the United States has been exploring those exports issues? So my philosophical angle into this <laughs> issue is, is really that uh, I've always thought about uh, the U.S. as, you know, a real free market. And, and I admire 
the way the, the U.S. economy, time, time and again, are able to fight crisis and come back and, and, and be uh, competitive. And, and that is Stotter's philosophy also that, uh, uh, you know, uh, competition is always good and uh, to have a free market uh, is good, o of course, dealing with externalities, but, but beyond that. Uh, and regardless of whether it goes against our activity or not, we have a principle of supporting uh, free and open, transparent uh, markets. And, and in terms of the export uh, issue, that would be the way we think about it too. And we think it would be an advantage for the world, for the US, uh, also to have a free, open global market when it comes to oil and gas. Uh, and actually on the oil side, we think that this will stimulate supply and, and therefore eventually also be mm -hmm. good for consumers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I know there are many details in this discussion, but, but this is really the principles and the way we think about it. Mm -hmm. So we would like to, to, to stimulate a, a, a debate of an open and free debate about how you can release some of your restrictions um, relative to, to oil export. Mm -hmm. Um, you spent a little bit of time in your speech, actually a good, a good amount of time talking about sort of climate change and how climate change fits into sort of the perspective on uh, oil and gas development. Uh, there is sort of a perception here that Norway has achieved something that perhaps the United States hasn't, which is the ability to be an oil and gas producer and also sort of an aggressive uh, proponent of doing something coordinated about reducing emissions. Um, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say we haven't achieved that here. Uh, and so, um, but you mentioned how that is actually sort of possible and, and practical that you can have a low carbon future that also includes oil and gas consumption and, and perhaps a significant increase in, in gas consumption over a certain time frame. How, how do you view the discussion about climate change both here and sort of internationally and, you know, as an enabler of your business, what would you like to see happen on that, uh, uh, on that file uh, going forward? I think it's quite interesting to note that uh, in Europe we set out with the ambition of having less CO2, uh, more security of supply and a more efficient uh, sort of energy uh, supply to, to, to stimulate competitiveness. And actually a few years after we have uh, not reached any of those objectives. We have perhaps less security supply, we have a very expensive energy system uh, in Europe, and we have more CO2 because the current uh, ETS mechanism does not work. And actually, we have focused on the renewable shares, and we have made good progress there. But actually, since we are importing coal from the, from the US, we are actually emitting more CO2. While in the US, you have actually been able to reduce CO2 emissions the last few years. Not so much because of regulations, because, but due to the fact that uh, you have an innovative industry that have been able to identify new techniques and technologies so that you can develop more gas that have replaced coal in the electricity sector. So I think that is an interesting perspective. And I also think underlining the importance of having simple systems where politicians do not decide what technology that should win, but rather create a system that is technology neutral, that can, can, can really stimulate the best innovator in, in terms of bringing forward, forward um, responses. It's interesting if we go to Norway that they introduced uh, a CO2 tax in the 90s. And uh, now it's roughly $75 per, per ton. So I think it's the most expensive CO2 cost ever in the world. And actually, it's working. Because the oil and gas industry have implemented every action with a cost below $75. And why is that? Because it's profitable. So I think from Norway we have a proof that it works. But of course, it is not globally efficient if you only have that system in, in, in one country. So you really need a system that is more global to, our, to avoid carbon leakage and, and, and all of that. And, and of course, that is Stutter's principal view, that the best thing would be to have a global price on carbon. And then industry will adapt and, and come forward with the best solution. 
but realistically, that is not, uh, uh, it's not realistic that, that that will happen anytime soon. And therefore, one has to, to, to I think, work on other mechanisms too. And uh, there are, you know, uh, emission standards and, and, and more regulatory approaches that I think can can work, but I think we need to work then with tools that minimize the carbon leakage mm -hmm. uh, issue, recognizing that, uh, that, that, that the CO2 and the climate issue is not national, it, it, it is a global issue. Yeah. 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 Well, I, we I recognize we have about 15 minutes left. I'd like to open it up to the floor for questions. Uh, we only have uh, two, two kind of three rules here. Uh, one is please wait for the microphone. Two is identify yourself and your affiliation, both for Helga and, and sort of our audience. And then three, please put your question in the form of a question. If we have a lot of them, I'll group them up a little bit. So, right, yes. Uh, thank you, Bill Murray from Energy Intelligence Group. Uh, thank you for your uh, interesting, fascinating uh, Speech, uh, one of the things you talked about a lot is how much offshore and what a large offshore producer you are. And to get a little technical in terms of the oil production, an increased increment of, uh, of uh, oil production globally will be offshore in the next five to seven years. Uh, they're very deep and as you know, they're very complex. Is there some connection between some risk of all the new capital the looking at the spending and the capital uh, spending that's happening with the IOCs in the last five years, is there some problem with uh, bringing down uh, the capex and capital investments in the next several years? Is there some threat that oil prices won't continue to stay stable? Well, I, I think the, the cost of capital issue now in the industry is a major issue that we de need to deal with in a much forceful much more forceful way than we have done in the past. My view, it's a personal view, and a Stottel view, therefore, <laughs> is that the oil and gas industry have been quite effective to deal with cost issues when the oil price is low. And then we, we work effectively one or two years to lower the cost, and then oil price is back, and then we're back on the, the same bandwagon as we were before. So I think the industry needs to seek inspiration from other industries that have been under pressure from years and years, perhaps decades, and then you know, trim their business systems, their value chain, in, in a much more efficient way than, than, uh, than, than we have been able to do. And, and you know that how, does, how do oil companies work with the supplier industry? Why do we innovate and find new solutions every time we're going to do a new project instead of uh, standardizing, and so on and so forth. I, I think that the current cost and capital challenge uh, might also uh, hamper and perhaps delay some of the most complex offshore fields and, 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 and opportunities. Perhaps the Arctic is, uh, and the most extreme areas of Arctic could, could be examples of that. Where may, maybe the industry, certainly Statoil, would, would take a pause in, in, in terms of thinking about the most complex uh, areas. There are other reasons for that too, but I think cost will be, 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 be such, an, uh, such an issue. Well, I think one of the industries, without being very specific about exactly what, where to learn, but I think the car manufacturers, you know, have been under decades of pressure and have been extremely efficient in, in streamlining their, uh, their, their, their business system. So I think we need to learn from the best one in this industry, Stato Leris. We need to learn from others. Mm -hmm. But I think also we need to look beyond our industry to seek inspiration and ideas on how we can... can uh, can do things better. I actually believe that Statoil have a, has an advantage in this because we are a pretty big operator at Norwegian Continental Shelf. So when we make uh, new initiatives for improvements, we can implement them on up to 40 platforms at the same time. Mm -hmm. so, so you can perhaps quicker get scale of the improvement uh, activities that we are entertaining. Uh, Bob Kopakin, uh, independent consultant. I was very impressed with Mongstad, the uh, carbon capture 
development that Norway spearheaded. And uh, I wonder what Statoil's reaction was when the labor-led government uh, canceled or discontinued that project. And how do you see Norway's carbon capture development going forward? Is this an example of a government deciding technology? Well, I think carbon capture and storage potentially is a very important long-term uh, solution. And the way we thought about uh, Mongsta and the project there was that uh, one of the, 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 the challenges was actually to, to scale up the technology so that we could learn how the process worked. So we started with a test center that could uh, clean out uh, or sequestrate roughly 100,000 tons uh, per, per year. And, and that uh, facility is in operations. So we are learning, testing two, two new technologies. And then the government decided to, to not, for many reasons, not go for the full scale uh, uh, facility now. And we have acknowledged uh, uh, that. And, and this is an area, I think, where we need to engage globally to, again, bring forward the best brain of the industry and, and related industry and research institutions to, to, to move forward. And, and at least my thinking is that the biggest issue around, uh, there are many issues, but the biggest issue right now is, is, is probably the cost issue. You, you really need to find a technology that radically reduce uh, the cost of carbon capture. Otherwise, it will be a rich man's solution that, that will not be applicable and, and really be dealt with on a global basis, which we need. Mm -hmm. Got a question right there? Hello, my name is Ellie Rostrom with Harvard University. I have two um, quick questions. The first is, you describe Statoil as a technology-focused um, company in the upstream sector. I would love to hear your thoughts on um, your investment uh, ambitions, particularly in high-risk areas like Iraq or Sub-Saharan Africa or even the Arctic, like you mentioned. My other question, um, I spent five years forecasting oil prices, by far the most exciting job I've ever had. Um, and Statoil was one of my clients, in fact. And I would love to turn the table around and see in the next five years, where do you see the oil price going? And I'm more interested in your views, directionally speaking, not so much as a function of, you know, China is going to carry us through next year, but more, you know, in five years, are we in 120? Are we higher? Or maybe we're lower? Well, um, I guess what you're you. going to do with the second part of the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the, one of the first statements I made to the media uh, <laughs> when I was uh, appointed in 2004 was actually that I said that probably a monkey could uh, predict the oil prices better than uh, a CEO. <laughs> and the, my oil traders and the analysts were not particularly happy with happy the new CEO <laughs> at, at that time. But that's still my view. But I can give you some, uh, you some, uh, <laughs> some, some thoughts. I mean, if you look at the forward curve, it seems that you know, the market has decided that you know, it, it, it will uh, go down. And I think that can very, very well happen. But I think people tend to underestimate perhaps two issues. One, the more or less permanent feature of political, geopolitical risks and uncertainty. And we tend to say once that is over, then the oil price will decline, and then there is a new issue, a new issue, a new issue. The second, which, I mean, you're a Harvard, so you, you will know this much better, but, but I think perhaps from time to time, people are underestimating the, the current cost challenges that we just spoke about in the oil and gas industry. And I, I think you saw that in the first quarter reporting among the IOCs. I think it was the 13th consecutive quarter where oil, price, oil production was actually declining, despite the fact that we, in this period, have been, had record high investments. So this is something I, maybe these two issues maybe could challenge that conventional wisdom now that the oil price is, is, uh, is, is going down. Mm -hmm. on, on, uh, on, on the technology, uh, we have a very interesting tax system in, in Norway. So ba basically, we pay 78% petroleum tax. So, so that, that is, uh, and it has been stable for many, many, many years. It has been a huge stimulator for technology and innovation because actually the tax man or the tax lady is actually paying 78% of the, the, the R&D. It has been a huge 
benefit for Norway, I think, as a society, because you attract the best companies of the world to Norway. Uh, you have extremely strong research institutions, and I think an evidence of this is that I think Norway has the highest uh, uh, recovery rate of any country in the world. And actually, on the stopped or operated field, we have a recovery rate now of more than 50% on our fields, which I think to a large extent has to do with, uh, with this. So we, we really believe in technology as a, as a business uh, uh, an, an enabler. But the oil and gas industry is in the same time a, in one way a very innovative industry and in another way we need to be quite careful because we're running with high risks. Uh, uh, so I think this step-by-step -step philosophy is also important and this is the way we think about Arctic for instance. People talk about Arctic as Arctic. In our view is many Arctics because you have what we call workable Arctic that we now have in Norway in the, in, in the northern part of Norway where we know uh, currently run the Snow White field, for instance, in the LNG field. No ice, I mean icebergs. And then we, the, the next category is really, uh, you, you know, what we called, uh, called, you know, stretch Arctic, which is more difficult, where you have icebergs and so on and so forth. And then you have extreme Arctic, where you have permanent ice that put a lot of new challenges of the industry where we really have to innovate in order to deliver. And, and I think this is a good way of thinking about how we as an industry can work more and more difficult areas if you go step by step. We had that discussion in Norway many years back since the 60s that we gradually moved activities up north uh, as the industry were able to show the authorities that we actually could deliver on the standards that they, they required. Maybe a long answer. One more over here. Thank you. I'm Federico Pellegrini, an intern here from Finance and Corporate Affairs. Uh, I was interested in asking um, uh, which is the way the, uh, and the degree of importance that you associate to corporate social responsibility in your business strategy, and if you think that CSR can have an, inf an influence and an impact in uh, your investors' behavior. Thank you. So this industry it's about the long term. And uh, in, in order to create stability uh, uh, around the facility that we're running, regardless of whether it's in the northern part of Norway, in Alaska, in Bakken, in Venezuela, in Brazil, or in Tanzania, I think you need to create ripple effects and you have to create trust in, in, uh, in your operations and your company and the, and the assets. Otherwise, I think it's very, very hard to uh, to, to, to develop successfully over time. And I read a study the other day where they, they looked at why did big projects in the oil and gas industry fail? And most people would think about there were technical factors, but actually in most cases, the oil and gas industry underestimates the issues above ground. I mean, the issues that you uh, talk about. So I, I do not think about CSR something on the side it has to be uh, you know, integrated fully into the philosophy of your company and be actually a very, I would say, it's not a soft part, a very hard part of the way you run and develop your company. If you have it as a side activity, you will lose almost uh, at the outset. So, so uh, um, it's, it's, it's a very important part of the, the, the value added of, of Statoil and, in my view, any other oil and gas company. Mm -hmm. And I think more so. My reflection is that um, public trust in big institutions, whether it's government and, or private, is actually going down in the society as such for many reasons, financial crisis and so on and so forth. While actually the society is expecting that we are part of uh, solving some of the most pressing issues in the society. I can hardly see, see how politicians can solve the climate issue. It has to involve uh, you know, private institutions and companies. Uh, and I think people expect us to, to help solve human rights 
uh, issues, and so on and so forth. Uh, so th this is actually something that top management in Statoil is working a lot on. Example, right now, big discoveries in Tanzania. First really big oil and gas project in, 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 in that country. How do we create a situation where that country really gets, gets the benefit and the majority of the values goes to, to the, 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 the people and how do we create sort of sustainability around our operations? It's technically that project is not, it's something that we have done before. The big issue is really how do we do align with the country? Well, I just want to thank you uh, very much for taking the time to stop by. I mean, I think that one of the really important things uh, in the messages you've delivered that I think is, is great for us to pay attention to is obviously this commitment to engaging, right? I mean, when you look at sort of the complex environment, managing a complex portfolio, the commitment it takes to innovate, the complacency that leads to sort of safety concerns, it all sort of leads to more engagement, not less. And I think we probably couldn't agree more that that is certainly a public and private sector uh, endeavor. So thank you very much for taking the time to stop by. We know you have a full agenda, but please thank you. Uh, help me thank, thank you. you.